It's with um, great pleasure that I introduce to you Walden Bellow. Oh, thank you. Um, and I would say that when we were planning this conference, as we were, as the steering committee was uh, coming together with the con conception of who would come, um, you know, and I think it might be fairly obvious, Walden is the one person who is on the speaker's uh, list who does not actually, is not from the Middle East and does not work on the Middle East. But in some ways, Walden Bellow embodies much of what we are talking about and thinking about these days in the Arab world. I mean, he spent uh, 20 years in the long struggle to overthrow the Marcos dictatorship and today you know in the uh, Republic of the Philippines he's a representative in the House of Representatives and I'd also just do a little shout out the ambassador to the Philippines is here so welcome to AUB um, well Walden has a prolific uh, uh, multi you know varied uh, record but just to mention a few of the things I mean he has written uh, 18 books uh, the most recent of which came out this year it's called Capitalism's Last Stand. Um, and he is the founding director and now the executive director of Focus on the Global South. And he was the 2003 winner of the Right Livelihood Award, which is often referred to as the alternative uh, Nobel Prize. And he was awarded that for outstanding efforts in educating civil society about the effects of corporate globalization and how alternatives to it can be implemented. So Walden today is going to be talking about how the Arab world at this juncture looks from other struggles and from other parts of the world. So thank you, Walden. Um, Yes, I would like to thank the Asfari Institute and uh, the American University of Lebanon, of Beirut, for inviting me to this important gathering to take stock of what has come to be known as the Arab Spring. I am grateful, of course, to my old colleague from Uni University of uh, California at Santa Barbara, Lisa Hadjar, uh, and also to the Ambassador Lilia Ruiz of the Philippine Embassy, who uh, facilitated uh, my entry into uh, uh, Lebanon uh, yesterday. Um, let me start on a personal note. I am not from the Middle East, nor am I an expert on the Middle East. I am from Southeast Asia, but the Arab cyclone has sucked me in in three ways. Uh, first of all, as a political activist, I was thrilled by the eruption of the anti-dictatorship struggles in the region, being reminded of our long campaign to bring down the Marcos regime a quarter of a century ago. I have also engaged in international debates on humanitarian intervention. I supported the uprising against Gaddafi, but I also joined those who raised their voices against NATO intervention, arguing that not only did it violate national sovereignty, but it would also bring about a worse situation politically and from the perspective of human rights. Second, as a member of parliament of a country with large numbers of migrant workers uh, in the region, I have had to pay close attention to the impact of the uprisings on my compatriots, making sure that most of them were moved out of harm's way. Slightly over a year ago, I was in Homs in Syria with a search and rescue mission of the Philippine Embassy looking for the Filipino domestic workers who had survived a brutal four-week siege of that city by the Assad regime so we could bring them home. My third level of engagement as a political analyst is what is most relevant here today, although this is closely tied in, of course, with my being a longtime civil society activist in human rights and democratic rights. About two years ago, soon after the Mubarak regime in Egypt, in Egypt fell. I wrote a piece war warning of key problems that had deformed the process of democratization in other parts of the world that the Arab democratic revolution needed to avoid. I highlight, highlighted two problems in particular. One was the hijacking of the political process by elites in the transition from the mass revolution to representative government. The second was the manipulation of the democratic legitimacy of the new regimes to impose neoliberal structural adjustment programs. Allow me to quote at length from that essay, and quote. For the expectant citizens of the new democracies in the Philippines and Latin America, people power euphoria gave way to Western influence parliamentary electoral regimes 
in which traditional economic elites promptly came to hold sway. Competitive politics flourished, but with factions of the elite competing among themselves for their right to reign. Progressive politics was marginalized within systems dominated by conservative or centrist elite agendas. Corruption greased the wheels of the system. Even as traditional elites hijacked the resurgent parliamentary systems, the United States and the multilateral agencies subverted them to push through austerity programs that the author authoritarian regimes they previously supported had no longer been able to impose on recalcitrant citizenries. It soon became clear that Washington and the multilateral agencies wanted the new democratic regimes to use their legitimacy to impose repressive economic adjustment programs and debt management policies. In Argentina, for instance, the international financial institutions pressured the post-dictatorship government of Raul Alfonsin to abandon neo-Keynesian policies, implement tax reforms, liberalize trade, and privatize enterprises. When the government quailed, the World Bank suspended disbursements of a structural adjustment loan to bring it into line. In the Philippines, one of the key reasons Washington abandoned Ferdinand Marcos was its realization that the dictatorship's lack of legitimacy made it an ineffective instrument for repaying the country's $26 billion foreign debt and for implementing the IMF World Bank Structural Adjustment Program. Not even the economic crisis accompanying the end of the regime stopped the bank and the fund from demanding that the fledgling government of President Corazon Aquino make debt repayment its top economic priority. In Eastern Europe and the old Soviet Union, the euphoria of 1989 gave way in the 1990s to hard times as the IMF took advantage of the transition from communism to impose shock therapy or the rapid and comprehensive imposition of market processes. The process led to a tripling of the number of people living in poverty to 100 million. Although in Eastern Europe, most liberal democratic regimes were able to survive the association with radical adjustment, in Russia and its former dependencies in Central Asia, the mafia capitalism that shock therapy has spawned led people to tol tolerate, if not support, the return or persistence of authoritarian regimes such as that of Vladimir Putin in Russia. By 2010, according to one analysis, some 80% of the residents of the former Soviet Union were still living or were back under authoritarian regimes. The political imagination narrowed, with democracy emptied of its direct unmediated character, dominated by competing elites, and unable to shake off its association with radical poverty creating market reform. And that's the end of the quote. Over two years after the outbreak of the anti-dictatorship struggles, how have the Arab movements fared with respect to confronting these two obstacles to the deepening of earlier democratic transitions? Let me first address the second obstacle to the democratization process, the imposition of the neoliberal agenda. This is clearly a threat to the Arab Spring. As in previous democratic transitions, the IMF hovers like an incubus waiting to poison the process. The fund says it is willing to assist the post-revolutionary governments of Tunisia and Egypt. The Tunisians have already signed a framework agreement with the fund for a $1.75 billion loan, the details of which are still in short supply. In contrast, the government of Egypt has put off agreeing to an IMF loan of $4.8 billion. There are those who say that there is a new IMF that does not insist on the old conditionalities. The IMF's recent record in Europe does not bear this out. It gave the good housekeeping seal of approval to savage austerity programs concocted by the European Commission for Greece, Portugal, Spain, and Ireland. Certainly, its demand that Egypt cut food and fuel subsidies to receive the loan underlines the fact that the leopard has not shed its spots. The Morsi government knows full well the fate of previous post-revolutionary governments that made a deal with the devil. In Egypt's case, such a pact would probably end up adding several million to the 40 million plus people that will really live before the, uh, below the poverty line, with tremendous negative consequences for the regime's revolutionary legitimacy. Let us take up the other obstacle to earlier democratic transitions that I highlighted the political derailment of the democratic process. 
In previous experiences, the main threat was the hijacking of the democratic process as the revolution passed from the direct democracy of the streets to representative democracy by elites that channeled political energies in a conservative direction that limited change to formal electoral competition and prevented the transformation of socioeconomic structures. In the case of the Arab Spring, however, it seems to me that the threat of derailment comes mainly from forces within the revolutionary coalition that have anti-liberal, anti-pluralist, totalitarian tendencies. I am referring to fundamentalist groups that would not hesitate to permanently marginalize secular forces or other parties. Unchecked, these forces become the main threat to the process of democratization. In such a context, one cannot overemphasize the importance of respect for formal democratic rules, truly free and fair elections, and rapid institutionalization of the inalienable, inalienable rights of minorities in the post-revolutionary regime. In this sense, the power-sharing agreement between what is seen as a moderate, moderate Islamist party and ADA that dominates parliament and two secular parties which control the presidency and the prime minister's office with civil society active in the street might provide lessons for other countries undergoing democratic transition. This, in, this is, I was citing the case in Tunisia. In this regard, the face, fate of democracy in Egypt hangs in the balance and the progressive secular forces in the opposition would do well to keep up their non-parliamentary forms of pressure until they are reasonably certain that the Muslim Brotherhood truly accepts democratic pluralism and respect for the rights of minorities as a matter of principle. From comparing the Arab Spring with previous democratic transitions on two dimensions, the subversion of the process by elites and the sapping of democratic legitimacy by the neoliberal agenda, let me move to a discussion of four related topics, the role of geopolitics, the dismantling of the central state structure, the resurgence of sectarianism, and the possibilities of democratic transition in the Arabian Peninsula. Clearly, the geopolitical dimension has had a much greater impact in the Middle East than in other democratic transitions. That is, foreign powers have had a greater propensity to intervene, as we heard earlier uh, by Professor Khalidi. Syria has become the Spanish cockpit of our time, with Iran, Iraq, the Hezbollah, and Russia coming out in support of the Assad regime, while the Western powers, Israel, and increasingly Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, actively working to jettison that regime. Instead of allowing an anti-dictator movement to unfold with its own dynamic and momentum, both sides are arming their respective dogs to the teeth, to borrow an image from former US Secretary James Baker, and converting a civil conflict into a proxy war. Libya, as everyone knows, saw the Western powers play a decisive role in a civil war, with the United States, as NATO's post facto assessment showed, being the key interventionist force in an fr effort fronted by France and the United Kingdom. The issue of Western intervention in Libya divided liberal and progressive forces, some of who saw it as humanitarian intervention in the name of res the responsibility to protect, and others like myself arguing against such an intervention. We base our position on a number of points. First, that the principle of national sovereignty is so precious for developing countries that only a clear-cut case of genocide would justify military intervention. Second, that each case of intervention, whatever its justification, whether humanitarian or not, would make future big power intervention more, more likely elsewhere in the world. And third, that intervention would bring about a worse situation than before. But I felt that the manner in which it was done had to be legitimate, that it had to be accomplished by the Libyans themselves in much the same way the Egyptians and Tunisians brought down their respective dictatorships by themselves. In the absence of a clear-cut case of genocide, I did not think NATO intervention was legitimate in Libya. I have a similar stance with respect to developments in Syria. One might object that this is setting the bar too high at the cost of violent deaths and violations of human rights. Yes, for the Western powers are so ready to use whatever pretext to intervene and roll back the gains that the South has made in the post-colonial period. Each intervention provides a precedent that encourages future violations of national sovereignty. 
There is a slippery slope from the NATO bombing campaign during the Serbia-Kosovo conflict in 1998 to intervention in Afghanistan in 2001, to the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and to the Western air war against Gaddafi in 2011. Liberal humanitarians in the West simply do not understand that the jealous guarding of our national sovereignty is central to the continued viability of the nation states in the South. Another characteristic of the Arab democratic transition, one that was not so present in earlier episodes of democratization, has been the fragmentation of the state. We already alluded to this in the case of Libya, where the central state is a ghost of what it was. And however it will ultimately be resolved, the Syrian cockpit is likely to result in the effective dismantling of the central state. Let me quote a recent New York Times piece in this regard, and I quote, Increasingly, it appears Syria is so badly shattered that no single authority is likely to be able to pull it back together anytime soon. Instead, three Syrias are emerging, one loyal to the government, to Iran and to Hezbollah, one dominated by Kurds with links to Kurdish separatists in Turkey and Iraq, and one with a Sunni majority that is heavily influenced by Islamists and jihadis." Unquote. What the Times does not say is that it is foreign intervention that is one of the key factors driving this fracture, fracturing of the Syrian state, and that, as in Libya, it is the Western powers, along with Israel, that will benefit from this outcome. Related to the fragmentation of the central state is the resurgence of sectarianism, which many see as its driving force. The pessimistic narrative is that the drive for democracy has ebbed, giving way to the more powerful pool of sectarian loyalties. This is one of those factoids that, owing to constant repetition by CNN and BBC, attains the status of truth in the minds of many outside the Arab world. But even in the world's most homogenous places, such as South Korea, democratic movements have always intersected not only with class, but also with communal, linguistic, and regional realities. Democratic revolutions have most often occurred in multinational states so that the drive for popular sovereignty has gone hand in hand with a push for sectoral autonomy, and both have made the central state ultimately not weaker, but more resilient and responsive. In, my, in, in this sense, this could have been the outcome in Libya had it not been for foreign intervention. It can still be the outcome of, for Syria if the momentum for intervention can somehow be reversed. Rather than look at sectarian loyalties as undermining the universal aspiration for democratic rule in the broader national collectivity, one must see the dynamic relationship between democracy and autonomy as a central force that has given rise to the great variety of modern democratic states with national governments achieving, uh, displaying an astonishing array of governance at the sub-national level. Indeed, it is the interaction among state centralization democracy and sectoral autonomy that has historically produced the conditions for tolerance and respect for the rights of minorities that is a central feature of the modern liberal democratic state that both liberals and progressives value. Tolerance, pluralism, and other virtues identified with progressive liberalism cannot be constitutionally imposed from above. Paradoxically, they develop from conflicts such as those that are now ongoing in the Arab world. Paradoxically, the intense sectarian strife that Syria and Iraq are now experiencing may yet produce dynamic pluralist democratic states. I believe that Joel Biden earlier alluded to such um, to processes. This is, of course, a truth that Lebanese do not need to be reminded of, nor, as Nassim Taleb has pointed out, has it escaped observers like Rousseau who wrote, citing Machiavelli, and I quote, it seemed wrote Machiavelli, that in the midst of murders and civil wars, our republic became stronger and its citizens infused with virtues. A little bit of agitation gives resources to souls, and what makes the species prosper isn't peace but freedom." Unquote. Of course, the contemplation of such positive effects in the long run is of no help to those currently caught in the grip of sectarian or ethnic strife. Let me bring up as a final point the implications of the Arab Spring for the Arabian Peninsula. So far, only Yemen and Bahrain in this geopolitical and geo 
economically strategic region have experienced pro-democratic uprisings. Let me just say that in my view, it is impossible to prevent the democratic ferment from spreading to Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and the Gulf Coast. It is this prospect that explains why the Saudi monarchy has increased social subsidies for its citizens and is only now seriously carrying out a process called Saudization to replace foreigners with the unemployed or underemployed Saudi youth. I think, however, that this, this is much too late and probably won't work owing to the overwhelming dependence of the economy on skilled, semi-skilled, and unskilled labor. And it's only a matter of time before the first signs of trouble will appear. In this regard, let me make two further points. One, democratic movements in Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states will find it hard to wage a successful democratic revolution without involving not only the oppressed Shiite communities, but also the vast underclass of foreign workers that make these economies run. Foreign migrant workers are a disproportionate part of the populations of the Gulf states, ranging from 25% in Saudi Arabia to 66% in Kuwait to over 90% in the United Arab Emirates and Qatar. These people are basically unfree labor. As Atiya Ahmad writes, and I quote, with the booming of the Gulf states' petrodollar-driven economies from the early 1970s onwards, a vast and consolidated assemblage of government policies, social and political institutions, and public discourse developed to manage and police the region's foreign resident population. Anchored by the kafala or sponsorship and guarantorship system, this assemblage both constructs and disciplines foreign residents into temporary labor migrants." Unquote. This elite promoted construction of migrant identity promotes an internalization of the migrants' role as social subordinates and an emasculation of their status as political agents. They're expected to remain and so far have largely behaved as non-participants in the politics of their so-called host societies, even, those societies, even as those societies are swept by the winds of political change. These workers have a strategic interest in political and economic democratization and they can spell the difference between the success and failure of the democratic revolution. Let me say that unless democratic Arab movements in the Gulf states bring these people into the revolution, they will not succeed. Unless they reach out to them, the elites will use these people to make the state and economy run smoothly while smothering the democratic revolt. The other point I would like to make in this connection is that in terms of intervention, we ain't seen nothing yet, to use another Yankee colonialism. With the Arabian Peninsula's massive oil and gas resources, the U.S. and Western powers will come in in a big, big way, whether or not the U.S. has by that time weaned itself from dependence on the Gulf resources. Massive intervention and the democratic uprising, these are two events that will inevitably clash in the Gulf. In conclusion, my, one may wonder whether, with all the violence, sufferings, and interventions it has unleashed, the Arab democratic uprising is worth it. Has it not opened a Pandora's box, the bad things from which outweigh the good? That neoconservatives and Zionists answer in the affirmative is not surprising, since they believe that owing to there being a Western outpost, only Israelis are capable of democratic rule. But often, when confronted with this question, many Western liberals and even progressives are often paralyzed. I think when addressing this question and related issues, it is useful for us to take a comparative perspective in the long view. With respect to violence and human rights violations, democratic transitions which are bloody far outnumber those that are peaceful. As Barrington Moore reminds us, their English transition to democracy, which is often mistakenly presented as a case of peaceful evolution, was a violent one that involved numerous deaths in a civil war and ended with the beheading of a king, Charles I, in the 17th century. And as Arnaud Mayer so vividly documents in his book, The Furies, the French Revolution, a classic democratic transition, saw the interplay between revolutionary terror and counter-revolutionary terror that took thousands of lives over a chaotic five-year period. Closer to our time, democracy in Guatemala was eventually won and consolidated but only at the cost of some 200,000 lives over a 25-year period. And I believe Lisa earlier appeared, uh, um, referred to the recent conviction of Rios Montt. 
uh, for his participation on this. Unfortunately, the Constitutional Court just two days ago overturned this conviction. To borrow religious imagery to which I'm usually allergic, the soil of democracy is watered with the blood of thousands of martyrs. But after the violence, after the bloodshed, will democracy ultimately prevail? Revolutions have their ebbs and flows, and it does seem like the solidity of the institutions that emerge are built on the inevitable struggles that the democratic revolution unleashes. In this regard, the French revolutionary process that began in 1789 can only be said to have been firmly consolidated with the Third Republic from 1870 to 1940. In between the countries so counter-revolution, Napoleon's imperial government, the revolution of 1830, the revolution of 1848, the Second Empire, and the Paris Commune. Much like France's experience, many democratic transitions are like a dance with several movements consisting of two steps forward and one step back, but the overall direction is forward. Closer to our time, the Latin American experience is instructive. The democratic struggles of the 80s were subverted and set back, as we noted in the beginning, by elite democratic regimes dominated by elites that imposed structural adjustment programs in the 1990s. But by the first decade of the 21st century, people throughout Latin America had had enough. People's movements produced new populist and more participatory democracies that supplanted elite democracies in Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador. And neoliberal economic regimes were dismantled in these countries, as well as in Brazil and Argentina. The democratic revolution had its advances and retreats, but the strategic thrust of the process was forward towards democratic deepening and consolidation. Indeed, the sharper and more protracted the struggle, the more firm it seems are the foundations of the democracy that emerges. The era of democratic revolution will have its ebbs and flows, but although I am an outsider, I'm reasonably confident that the omega point of the Arab Spring will be the institutionalization and consolidation of democratic forms and practices that will have their own unique features and dynamics. Thank you very much. sectarian divisions within the Philippines and the lessons that we in this part of the world can learn from the Philippines. Uh, is it maybe uh, also if you could talk a little bit about the configuration of the Philippines as an island state where maybe one uh, type, one group controls one island and the other the, uh, the next and how this has an effect on uh, sectarian divisions. Thank you. Um, okay, well, let me just uh, say that um, the, um, um, it was during the Marcos regime back in the early 70s that we had the um, 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 breakout, the outbreak of the Muslim insurgents in the South. And um, it has taken since 1974 to last year to finally achieve uh, a peace agreement okay, with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Uh, so um, basically, I, I, I think that this was, I would almost like to say that this was the last stage of the normalization of a uh, process uh, that began under the dictatorship, and it took, you know, uh, it took 30 years, you know, to finally come to this point. And um, yes, the momentum for, um, you know, the, the momentum is um, is I think building up, uh, uh, you know, for a final resolution of uh, uh, with respect to the to the um, to the Moro or the Muslim um, um, revolt in, in the country. Um, uh, well, that would be, I think, you know, we still have um, um, the, o, the, the um, New People's Army or the Communist Party that is active in parts, you know, in, in marginal parts of the country, uh, but it's not uh, 
uh, you know, their, their, you know, their, their level of, of intensity of, um, of, their, of, of their insurgency at this point is, is quite, has, is much lower than it was in, in previous uh, years. So uh, I would say that with respect to the, I would say that with respect to the Philippines, um, you know, these are some of the realities that um, uh, have um, transpired over the last few years. I think that, um, uh, let me just point two other things out, that um, uh, probably in Southeast Asia at this point, the two most stable countries are the Philippines uh, and Indonesia. However, I would say though, that in both countries, but particularly with respect to the Philippines, the situation that I have described, which is that uh, elites, uh, uh, after the, the, the fall of Marcos, uh, basically um, uh, economic elites became resurgent and took advantage of competitive politics to basically resist socioeconomic transformation um, holds still. Uh, we have a coalition, uh, we have a, a, a coalition government at this point in time that which, war, uh, which uh, our party is part of and um, uh, the big challenge that uh, it, it has had an, um, a program, an, an anti-poverty and an anti-corruption program in its first three years, um, but the big challenge uh, in the next three years of the Aquino administration is precisely this, this issue of major structural transformation, which is long overdue. Uh, in, in, in the country. So these are sort of the contradictions of the Philippine situation at this point. Questions? I want to thank you for reminding us of things we don't talk about a lot. First, that you don't create democracy by democratic means. Second, that uh, revolutions usually end up in civil wars. Third, that you never get 95% of the population behind the revolution, so that we don't spend our time feeling sorry that some 40 or 50% of our people are not following this or that uh, revolution. So thank you very much for that and others. And that they said that the revolutions fail, and that they, uh, the silly French example took, took a whole century to achieve uh, democracy. Because I mean, we're in a hurry, and uh, of course we can't wait for a year or two uh, <coughs> because we want uh, to consume democracy, not to produce. Now, on the issue of uh, <coughs> intervention, uh, I, like you, was against the uh, NATO intervention. But I think we should be frank enough to say that had the NATO intervention not happened, Mohammed Kazef would still be in power. Or a blood uh, but, and would have given Europe and the West most of the things they would have not wanted. So, I mean, it's not only saying that it's not necessary that he would have carried a carnage. It's necessary to say that had this intervention not happened, Kazakh would still be involved. It could be, I mean, what should stick to his own uh, opinions, but at least it's our conscience what prevents us to imagine what would have happened. Uh, most probably would have, have overrun uh, Benghazi and uh, had enough force to reimpose himself uh, on the country. Concerning Syria, the question we don't ask because we all started with the assumption that the United States, Israel are all ready to intervene. But we don't ask the question how come they did not for the past two years and a half. It's beautiful to produce positions. But why not? Who? Who are the United States behind? Why, why does it happen that now the whole issue of <coughs> dropping Mr. Assad has been taken off uh, the agenda? What is the importance of <coughs> the role of the Syrian army in preserving peace on the northern borders of Israel in Syria and Lebanon? <coughs> how come, how come uh, the minimum uh, required for an alternative to not please Western powers. And so let's not 
يعني it's not totally dark. يعني the other domino effect it happened in Libya is going to happen in <coughs> in in Syria. I'm I'm really curious why we never asked ourselves the question why hasn't the United States and the Atlantic powers uh, ventured into into Syria since the assumption is that they want to get rid and dismantle this uh, regime. So I do hope sometime we get the chance to uh, raise this question and discuss it. Thank you. I would like to pick up the, the issue of involving uh, immigrant workers, you know, for the democratization process. Do you have any examples in mind to give us about such a possibility in our region? Mentioning the IMF and uh, trying to bring in Rashid, yeah, Rashid's point earlier on today uh, regarding uh, the uh, the petrol monarchies. That's, that's um, it's interesting to uh, think with regards to the Egyptian uh, the pending loan from the IMF with Egypt. Uh, that the Morsi government decided not to uh, to sign. Mm -hmm. That uh, it was it was made possible not to sign it because the Qataris and the Libyans and the Turks stepped in and they presented Egypt with an alternative, which they don't call it a loan; they call it a fund, which um, is not uh, as such subject to parliamentary oversight which may have a larger interest on the long run than the loan that uh, uh, was being offered uh, from the IMF and whose conditions, most importantly, we don't know. So again, it's one of these complicating uh, factors. So, I mean, in, 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 your, in, in your presentation, you referred to the IMF as the devil, but there, there, are more, there, there are many kinds of devils in the region as well. So it's... Uh, it's one of the peculiarities, again, of the region, and I, I, I thank you for your presentation. Also, thank you, Chief, for pointing this out. I'll take one more question, and then we can let uh, all of them respond to all of these. Hi. Uh, if we are to look a little bit forward on the case of Syria, um, I'd like to ask, um, what is the role of the civil society, those structured, uh, those structured groups of youth that went out on the streets? Uh, we keep on debating that at some point the role will be into politics, into uh, um, development, working, uh, some would say advocacy, but looking at this very complicated case of uh, the economic situation, the, the uh, social, uh, social divisions, that identity, that let's say, what people would call it, the dark ages of uh, the Middle East, what, what, where is there room to maneuver? Um, okay. Uh, thanks for giving me some really difficult questions to answer. <laughs> um, well, um, first maybe on the easiest point. Um, uh, the the role of migrant labor in in um, in the Gulf, uh, and as as and we Lebanon. Saw, and Lebanon, okay. Um, well, uh, let me just say that you know for some of these states we we have fairly large concentrations of migrant workers, uh, diverse, many of them from South Asia. Uh, many of them from Southeast Asia, uh, many of them coming from other parts of the Middle East, like Palestinians. Okay. Um, and um, I think, um, as, as we noted earlier from, the, from um, Atiyah Ahmed's quote, that basically when they come in, there's a very strong disciplining factor that basically you're just here for a few years, you don't have any rights, okay, and that you're not supposed to participate in politics. No? And um, I, uh, my, my sense, though, is that it's going to be very difficult 
um, to insulate them from any sort of democratic discontent that you know takes place within the broader uh, Arab uh, community. Um, of course, there is um, uh, probably people still um, worry about it, but. Uh, uh, the negative um, 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 what happens when a foreign workforce uh, participates um, in in um, uh, you know in in, 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 in transformation in, within a society and that negative example that many of course in the Gulf bear is the I believe what happened uh, to Palestinians uh, during the, um, you know, when, when uh, Saddam invaded um, Kuwait and when the, uh, when he was thrown out, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, retribution fell on them. Uh, and probably that memory is there. Uh, however, I do, I, I, my, my sense though is that uh, when you come to the Gulf, when you come to Saudi Arabia, where I think, um, the, the estimate of the foreign workforce being just 25% is, I think, an underestimate. Um, you know, these are, you know, these are, you know, these are foreign workers that um, uh, are, you know, yes, they, there's an effort to discipline them uh, into being a very pliable workforce, but uh, at the same time, uh, in conversations that I've had with, with um, people, migrant Filipinos in the area, they talk about you know, the fear of the regime, uh, the reasons that they're being um, uh, displaced right now, how it's too late for the regime uh, to be replacing them with Saudi youth uh, because of the great dependence at all levels. Uh, so um, my, 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 my sense though is that um, if, they are not brought into the process. Uh, my sense is that they will be used, you know, in terms of being to, to make the machinery run, uh, uh, the economics, uh, uh, the the economy, and the 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 political machinery run, uh, while the you know they're trying to contain uh, the the um, uh, you know the domestic uh, population uh, in you know in 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 in, in this process of um, um, you know uh, of democratization. So I would, uh, if if you're asking about a positive example right now uh, of uh, participation in this, I I I don't think that from the Gulf states um, I am aware of one. However, I do I I think though that the idea that they would just remain pliable forces disciplined by the petro monarchies um, in the event of a democratic upsurge, uh, I think that many of these people are really quite politically conscious, you know, and I think that um, if they see things tilting one way or the other, to expect them to just remain as they are uh, would probably not be quite realistic. So again, I would, I, I, I would say that they are, especially in the Gulf states, where in many of the states they are a very sizable minority, if not the majority, um, I, I think that they do remain a factor to be contended with once the democratization process moves in these countries. Um, now, the harder issues, uh, Libya. Um, I, Going back to 2011, uh, yes, I, 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 um, the scenario that uh, you painted, um, I, I think that that was um, certainly a possibility at that point in time. I mean, that, that the regime would have recovered. Um, the question of the carnage, yes, you did point out that that might not have been take, that might not have taken place. I uh, I think that uh, if I recall right, the 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 Western press and the Western government sort of uh, deliberately distorted one of Gaddafi's speeches to say that he's about to kill you all, you know. Uh, and I 
I do think from what I read, uh, and I, I looked at that speech, and it did seem like uh, you know, the way that it was interpreted to bring about uh, intervention, um, that um, there, there was a deliberate distortion, but you did, you did say that that might not have taken place. Um, would he have been able to overrun Benghazi? Again, these are, you know, the, the, the problem really with this uh, uh, saying that he would have been able to overrun Benghazi is that I, uh, how do you put it now? Um, it, 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 there were so many different factors at work at that point in time at this level. So I, I, I'm not exactly, it, 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 this is quite difficult in this sense, but um, my, my sense is that um, you, there is a possibility, a very strong possibility that you would still have the civil war raging at this point. Uh, and um, the second thing is um, I think that um, a major, con but, you know, would Gaddafi be a greater asset for the West than Libya at this point in time? That is a question mark for me too. I, I, I do think that Libya at this point is, you know, with, with all the conditions that I listed, is, is so much more of a pliable state uh, for the United States and the Western powers at this point in time. Um, I think, though, and I'll come, I, I come back to this, that, um, that what happened in Libya um, uh, has made, um, as I said, there's this slippery slope, okay, that, that one intervention makes it much easier to move uh, into another intervention. And this is the way that I've just, I, I've just been worried ever since 1998 with the Kosovo bombing, that it's, you know, that it was used to justify uh, the, um, the intervention in, in Afghanistan, and Afghanistan was used to justify Iraq, and Iraq was used to justify um, uh, Libya, or, well, it wasn't quite explicitly used to justify that, but I, I'm, I really am, um, I, I really, really think that um, uh, unless there is, a clear-cut case of genocide going on. I I think that for a variety of reasons, but including the fact that uh, uh, we we can't afford any more erosion of the principle of national sovereignty by Western powers, that um, we must, uh, you know, uh, we, we must fight uh, uh, intervention at all costs. Uh, because the implications are not just for the country. The implications are for the whole of the global south, in my view. Um, Syria, um, well, it does seem like um, um, the questions that you post uh, with who is really siding with whom at this point in time, uh, is there really uh, a very clear cut distinction between the pro-Assad and the um, um, and the anti-Assad forces within the um, external players. Um, for me, I think this is very much of an empirical question. I would, I would really like to look at this much more closely, if indeed. Um, but I would not, uh, um, I would not uh, put it beyond the United States and the Western powers to be playing double games here uh, at this point in time. So this is definitely something that uh, we need to look at more. Closely. However, uh, the point, though, is that um, um, it, it has become a proxy war, okay? And um, uh, I think that it, it's becoming a proxy war is just going to increase the levels of bloodletting as well as the sort of irreconcilable polarization uh, in, in the situation so that my sense is that from someone who would be um, uh, supportive of, of the forces of democratization in Syria and the region, I think uh, as somebody in the solidarity movement, 
Uh, I think the main task I would say at this point is to move towards sort of reversing this momentum towards intervention. Of course, that seems like that's a big, di that's a great, uh, that's a big task. But nevertheless, I think that 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 is sort of the that is sort of a responsibility for the uh, for the solidarity movement um, at this point in time. With respect to the the IMF and and um, and um, Egypt. Um, from what I could understand from a number of the accounts that I've read, uh, the, the, the sticking point has been the uh, elimination or radical reduction of the fuel and food subsidies. Um, and that's, uh, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen the actual um, sort of proposed agreements, but a number of the accounts that I've read is that those are the sticking points. Um, and uh, I would not be surprised given, you know, the role of the IMF in Europe at this point. There used to be a time when they said that um, Dominic Strauss-Kahn and Christine Lagarde sort of represented the new face of the IMF that was more Keynesian rather than uh, anything. But it's clear that, that with the IMF's role in Europe, which has been to back austerity programs that were even worse than what was imposed in many developing countries um, that I, I don't think this really holds, which is why I would, I would, I would tend to agree with the, with the reports that it has really focused on cutting back on the fuel and, 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 um, and um, uh, food subsidies. Um, with respect to the loans that have pro been provided by um, uh, by Libya and by Qatar. Uh, yes, um, I, I think this this uh, y this this have been um, given, uh, and um, would, but I'm not exactly sure if. Uh, well, first of all, I think there's they, they uh, you know the level of the loans is quite much lower than what they're trying to seek with the IMF. Isn't that right? No, it's much bigger. Okay, well. You know, I, I would like to really look more into what um, what are the conditions that they they would be imposing uh, on on, or if there are no conditions at all. Um, although I would, I but from the latest report, I think that the IMF is still quite eager to get an agreement with uh, with Egypt, uh, and I'm not exactly sure if it's the the fallback into the Libyan and Qatari loan that is preventing Morsi from agreeing or from my interpretation, the fear of the backlash that would, it would create uh, and destabilize what you had, you had already painted as a government that was in grave danger um, of, you know, that couldn't quite control um, so many different forces uh, in, in, in Egypt. So th those are my, um, responses to these difficult questions that have been posed <laughs> with respect to the Arab transition. Well, thank you so much for coming. Everybody join me in giving okay. <laughs> Thank you. See you all tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And for the participants in the conference, the taxis will, will meet down in the lobby of the Jeff at 8, and we'll go to the restaurant okay. tonight. Tonight, okay. Tonight, yeah. okay.